So hello, everyone's leaving. That's a good sign. Uh, just before I start, is anyone using PHP spec? Oh, thank you. Thank you for you people. Are people doing test-driven development? Okay. Is anyone writing tests at any time? Okay, cool, that makes sense. So I'm gonna be talking about this tool PHP spec. Uh, and something you may find when you go to the documentation and start reading is that we describe it as a BDD tool. So uh, I like to address early on in the talk what that means, what, what is BDD. Um, is it the same thing as TDD? The, the short answer is yes. It's pretty much the same thing as TDD. Um, BDD is a whole set of practices, and PHP spec is one part of a whole stack of things we do to build projects. Um, the guy who came up with BDD is a guy called Dan North. He at least came up with the term. And for years, people kept asking him for a definition of BDD, uh, and he didn't want to provide a, a definition. He said it's too complicated. Eventually, someone persuaded him to come up with a definition. So if you go to Wikipedia, you find out that BDD is a second-generation, outside-in, pool-based, multiple stakeholder. Um, I couldn't fit it on one slide. Multiple-scale, high-automation, agile methodology. Uh, and that is all true. So uh, my colleague Constantine did a great talk where he went through that statement and unpacked every section and explained why it was true. But it took him about an hour, so I'm not going to. Um, someone else in the BDD community who's awesome, uh, Liz Keough, she came up with a definition of BDD. It's the art of using examples in a conversation to illustrate behavior. So it's kind of easier to understand. So that doesn't sound a lot like testing. It doesn't really sound like the kind of thing you think about when you think about testing. So let's go back a step. There's this thing called test-driven development. Uh, it's mostly Kent Beck's fault. Uh, and it's a way of developing software. And for those of you who've not come across test-driven development, the whole talk's about this, so don't worry. I'll briefly explain. You start your process by writing a test. So that's a weird thing to think about. You start by writing a test. And the test is, how am I going to test afterwards that what I've built is correct? So I start by thinking about testing. That, that leap of doing that first is, is a very big change in your workflow, but it's very, very productive. And once I've written a test, I then write some code that's going to pass the test. Because I took the time to write the test first, when I was writing the test, I thought about that object from the outside. I thought about what it should do, what it should be called. I thought about how clients will interact with that object, all before I thought about that messy stuff in the middle of how am I actually going to make it do all of these things. So afterwards when I'm writing the code, I have this test that guides me. It tells me when I've got stuff wrong, because it fails. It tells me when I've achieved the, the initial goal, because the test starts to pass. And there's a third phase in TDD called refactoring. This means once it works, you start making it better. You start making the design better, but without adding extra stuff. You've got passing tests. You can make design changes. The tests will tell you if you've broken anything. So switching to TDD is, it really revolutionizes the way developers work. Uh, and I can talk about it for, I, I do regularly talk about it for whole days at a time. But there's a problem when you're teaching people TDD, and this is what Dan North found, I think he was working at ThoughtWorks, is you start by saying, the first thing you do is write a test. And that sounds weird to people because normally we think of a test as something we do afterwards. We build something and then we test it. So writing the test up front, what, once you get it, you really get it, and it becomes natural, but it's hard to explain to new people. So Dan was working on a framework called uh, jbehave in Java, and he made a sort of simple change. He just didn't include the word test. Because it's hard, if you say test first, people look at you a bit strange. He said, what well, you start by describing what the object's going to do. So it's the same cycle. It's the same concepts. It's the same keystrokes, nearly. 
But instead of thinking of it as writing a test up front, instead of saying the first thing I'm going to do is think about how I'm going to test it, what you're doing instead is you're thinking about how you're going to describe the design to someone else. You're writing a specification. Okay? So before you write your code, you write some examples of what that code will do in different situations as a design mechanism. So if you explain this to TDD practitioners, they say, yes, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I mean when I say test. It's just for, it helps beginners, really. That's the main difference. And this focus on treating these things as specifications is what leads BDD to focus maybe more on descriptiveness. Uh, and it's helped BDD propagate upwards from doing this on the class level to thinking, well, maybe a user story is a description of the feature. And we're going to do a similar cycle with our user stories. Maybe our user stories make up a project. So at the start of the project, we'll set some kind of goal. We're going to sell more shoes. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and we'll know if we've succeeded when we've sold that number of shoes. So BDD becomes a workflow that's all about different levels. Today, we're going to stay at this class level, designing individual objects. Uh, and Sebastian and I are going to talk tomorrow about different tools and how you choose them. But to give you a kind of simple perspective of where PHP sits um, on two axes, if you think about low-level and high-level tests, so tests that are just for one class at a time versus tests that maybe execute your entire system. Uh, and there's an axis here of thinking about them more as uh, specifications or thinking about them more as tests. I hope that makes sense. These are two aspects. We're going to talk about four tomorrow. <laughs> and there's this uh, awesome tool called PHP Unit that I started using in about 2007. And it, it was the first tool I ever used to do TDD. Um, Sebastian's fault. And it really, really, really changed the way I wrote code. I did this TDD cycle. And it, I won't sell you on the benefits. That's for tomorrow. But importantly, PHP unit, you can use it to test individual classes, or you can use it to test your entire system or anything in between. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, like a multi-tool. It's flexible. It can be used for lots of different situations. Um, so if you only want to use one tool, use PHP unit. Or if you're going to use your first, if you're going to introduce testing into an organization, PHP unit can be a good, good place to start. Um, it's on version 6, and it has worries like backward compatibility. So being a younger project, we have a bit more flexibility. No one's using our project, so we can change stuff. Um, another project I'm kind of involved in is BHAT. Is anyone using BHAT? OK. So BHAT's all about testing your object at quite a high level, high to medium level. So you can use it to test the UI of your object. You can also use it to test your object's internals through some kind of service layer. And it's definitely in the BDD camp. It's all about having a conversation first with a human and treating it as a specification. And afterwards, it turns into documentation. So when you're using BHAT, there's a little gap at the bottom for a tool like PHP spec. Double click. So PHP spec fills this gap at the bottom. It's, it's covering the same sort of territory as PHP unit, testing classes at a low level. Because we're focusing on just doing that, we can make some optimizations. We can make some assumptions. We can assume you're definitely testing one class and one class only, and maybe make the tests a bit more expressive uh, for that specific use case. When I started cooking, I bought one knife and used it for everything. And now I've got like a little one for fiddly stuff and a, a big specialized one. That's how I think about these tools. <laughs> PHP Specs just for that low level stuff. It's painful to use it for other things. So it's opinionated. We've got little interest in helping you test bad code. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. So spec, P, spec BDD with PHP Spec. 
Is that the spec level, the class level? It's a BDD tool. And it's all about describing classes by giving examples. The project was started by uh, these two guys, Travis and Padraig. Um, I don't think they made it to version one. They started the project, but if you've done any open source stuff in the PHP community, you'll have seen those names everywhere. So they're spread across a lot of projects. They didn't um, carry on really with PHP spec. And it was inspired by a really nice tool called RSpec. BHAT and PHP spec were both inspired by tools from uh, the Ruby community, because a lot of the early BDD automation was done in Ruby. And it was, a, it was quite a nice tool. But it, it was a bit too similar to the Ruby tool. It had some concepts in it, like it had declared some global functions and things that make sense in Ruby, but don't really make sense in PHP. And my friend Marcelo um, ended up getting involved in the project uh, and took over eventually as lead maintainer. And we started using it at our company for a lot of testing. But it had, had a few issues. It was a bit too much like Ruby. So, wow, when was that? Four years ago now, maybe? Um, Marcelo and a guy called Konstantin Kudryashov, who's known online as Everzet, who is the guy behind BHAT. They thought, let's take PHP spec and let's rewrite it completely and take everything we learned from version one and make a version two. Uh, arguably, they should have changed the name because there's really no compatibility at all between the versions. This was before semantic versioning got trendy. Uh, it was the early days of Composer. And they had a few design principles. It's optimized to be descriptive. So the idea is you, you want to be able to read the specification and understand what that object does. So there's a bit of magic. Some people don't like magic methods and things. There's a bit of stuff in there that tries to make it as easy as possible for you to write a concise explanation of what the object should do. This is a, the biggest one. We want to encourage good design. So we're not a nice, friendly project like PHP Unit who will help you test anything. We want you to be able to test good code. So we do actively reject features that are for you know, fiddling around with visibility of things to get into legacy code and help you test it. We think by excluding those things, when you're writing new classes, you can't test the bad design decisions, and you can test the good design decisions. And we want to encourage the TDD cycle that I described. We want to make you write the test first. So there's some stuff that I know Sebastian doesn't like, code generation stuff, that's almost an attempt to brainwash the users into writing the test first. We want to make it more convenient for you to write the test first than to not write the test at all. That's, a, that's one of the goals. And as a contrast to the version one, we want it to look more like PHP. We want it to look kind of familiar to PHP developers. Um, unfortunately, Constantine and Marcelo are both very busy. So they started this PHP spec two project, and they didn't ever get around to using a stable release. So I worked with PHP spec two beta on uh, customer projects that went into production, and it was still a beta. It's OK. It's just a testing tool. It's not got any security issues. And I got frustrated, so I started becoming more and more involved with the project. And uh, before the stable release, I was pretty much closing all the pull requests, fixing a lot of bugs, and I've, I'm now the lead maintainer of the project. We've had five minor releases, and each one Last time I did this talk, I said we just add a little bit every time. It hasn't changed a lot. But I went back and looked at version 2, and the cumulative changes from version 2 to 2.5 are, are really massive. Uh, so it's been getting better and better. So let's take a look at uh, how you use it. Um, you install with Composer. Um, and as long as you've got an autoloader from Composer, we, we try to make it as easy to use as possible, so you don't have to have any configuration, really. If you've got an autoloader with PSR0, it, you don't need any configuration. If you use PSR4, you need a little bit of configuration, but that might change soon. So you compose your install. 
I'm not going to pretend to type. <laughs> I, could, I could try and trick you. But uh, normal stuff uses a couple of Symfony components. And so you need to start somewhere. So you start with a top level requirement. We've decided that our customers would be more loyal if when I log into the website, it says, hello, Kieran, on the website. We think that will make customers feel warm and uh, fuzzy towards us. So we'll get more purchases. That's an example of a top level requirement. So now I need to describe an object. So I'm not writing a test, remember. I'm going to write a description of what this, the object that fills this behavior is going to do. And in PHP spec, we use the describe command. Uh, I describe it, and that will generate a specification. And a specification is a class. A class has methods, and those methods are called examples. So this is a, analogous to a test case and a test, but thinking of them as examples maybe helps you figure out what's the next example I'm going to write. So type PHP spec describe. Uh, I use a forward slash for the namespace because using backslashes in bash is difficult. And the tool generates a specification for me. Can you read that OK at the back? Yeah, OK, cool. Um, so something to note there is I haven't really told the tool where to put this specification. It's just kind of assumed that the structure of my specifications in this spec folder is going to mirror the structure of the classes in my source folder. That's an example of an assumption we can make, because this is just for testing classes one at a time, and you're not going to be writing any other kind of tests with this tool. So if we look at the specification that's generated, um, it's a specification. And the only example of the object's behavior we have at the moment is that the object can be, create, can be initialized. So it's initializable. The object has this type. And if I'm going to go around my TDD cycle quickly, that I don't need to write another test. I can now execute the suite and say, does this specification match the reality? So that's the way to think about it. You do do testing in, with PHP spec. What, the testing bit is when you run it, and the tool compares the specification with the real system. And the command for that is PHP spec run. So when I run it, the suite immediately fails in this beautiful purple color. Purple color means broken. You can see it says one example, one broken. Broken means there's no logic error. There's not a failing test. It's something that actually broke inside PHP. And the thing that broke is this class that you're talking about doesn't exist, which makes sense. This is going to drive me to create the class. Uh, and this is part of the thing to trick you into writing the test first. If a test fails and we, there's literally only one way to fix that failing test, we want the tool to maybe do it for you. So the tool will say, this class doesn't exist. Do you want me to create that class for you? Right. So if I answer yes, you can see the class is generated. And then the tool automatically reruns the test suite. And this time it passes. Because we only have one specification. There's this class that exists. Um, and if I look at the class that's been created for me, this is templatable. If you want to put at author with your name in or something. Or maybe more relevantly on a project, you might need some copyright notice or something. If you really hate that code generation thing, there's an option just to switch it off. You can make the class yourself. So we haven't really talked about real behavior yet. So one behavior of the class might be when it greets somebody, it says hello. So who writes this example? Um, it's not an example you're going to take to the business. It's an example you take to another developer. Or it's an example for yourself next week when you've forgotten what this thing's supposed to do. So the way I express that example in PHP spec is like this. This greet should return hello. So there's a couple of weird things happening. 
One is that we haven't told PHP spec how to instantiate the object we're going to test. This is another case of an assumption. PHP spec knows which object you're testing, and unless it needs some constructor parameters, you don't need to instantiate it yourself, because it's always the case that you're testing one object. And in the context of a specification, we use this to refer to the object being specified. So this, in PHP terms, is, of course, the, the specification. But I call the method on this as if I'm calling it on the object, with the parameters that I would call on the object. So once you're used to PHP spec, when I call greet with no parameters on this object that we're describing, it should return hello. So maybe you can see that we're trying to be descriptive, we're trying to make it concise, trying to make it easy, all that kind of stuff. So next time I run the tool, it fails again. It's broken again. So there's no logic error. There's a breakage because we've tried to call a method that doesn't exist. And again, there's only one way to fix that. We make a method with that name. So the tool will actively say, would you like me to create a method with that name? When I say yes, the test runs again. This time, it's red. There is a failure. You said it would return this string. Actually, it returns a null. The reason it returns null is that the method that's been inserted doesn't have any logic in it yet. I hope this is all making sense. Um, so finally, we're at the bit maybe where we can write some code and implement that step. It's worth mentioning there is a, another feature called faking. So there's a parameter you can pass called fake, or there's a config option. Uh, so most of the time, if there's only one way to fix the test, PHP spec will offer to do it for you. This adds another case where if there's an empty method and you've described it and said it will return a particular value, it will offer to make that happen for you. So if I run again with fake, it will say, you told me it would return hello, but it returned null. Would you like me to make it return hello for you? Uh, and when I say yes, the test, test pass. When you use a tool like this all the time, you feel really good when you see green. It's like a Pavlov's dogs. You just think, yes, green again, awesome. So the quicker you get to green, the, the better. And it's just inserted a, a constant return. That bit's optional, some people don't like it. That's why there's a flag. So there's not that many things that, you can, that an object can do when you call a method. It can return a value. It can throw an exception. It can talk to another object. It can do all that PHP stuff like writing files, but we live in object land, so none of that happens in our core domain. Um, so when you want to test a method that returns a particular value, we do that using a matcher. Um, we've already seen should return. It just checks that the, the value that was returned is the, identical to the one in the specification. It has some aliases. You probably wouldn't put lots of aliases in a testing tool, or if you did, you'd mark them as deprecated, but if you're thinking about it in terms of descriptiveness, um, should equal sounds better to me when I'm talking about numbers. And something that's a bit getterish should return sounds better. So we have, we have some aliases built in. I think this also should be identical to, but people don't use that so much. You can check the type of the thing that came back um, pretty simply. Again, should have type is the same as should return an instance of. It's all contextual, which you think sounds best. In fact, an alias of this matcher is should be, which when you're chaining it like this doesn't read well. This greet should be hello doesn't make sense. But if you call this greet and assign it to a message, and then call message should be, that, that sounds more fluent. The aim of this talk isn't for you to memorize these, so I'm just going through quite, quite quickly. And there are some kind of fuzzy matches in there. 
um, that I'm not that convinced we should have in a you know, core domain testing tool. I feel like a lot of the time you should know what the exact value that's going to come back is, but um, should match checks that a string matches a regular expression, should contain checks that an array contains a particular value. Right, so that's all for simple return types. With objects, there are some optimizations to make things a bit more readable. If I call should be something, then the tool will check does the object have a method is that thing, and does that return true? Also, if I call should have logged in user, it looks for a method called has logged in user and checks that it returns true. And all of these matches, because it's done through magic methods and stuff, they all have a negative version, should not be admin, would also work and check that is admin returns false. Some people hate this bit, it's all optional. It can make it easy to read. And a good thing to do if you want your test to be descriptive is to write your own matches. So an example here is we want to check that a a return value has a particular JSON key in it. So it's going to return some JSON. We expect that a particular key is present. And including the details of JSON parsing in the test would make the test harder to read, especially if you're going to do it in multiple places. So you're, you can uh, inline in your test declare a matcher for have JSON key that receives a callback, a callable. And then it means your example can be a lot more readable. This get response data should have the JSON key username. Um, by defining the matcher, the negative will automatically work, should not have JSON key. If you're doing this a lot, in a lot of places in your test suite, uh, you can write objects instead of callables that implement an interface and register them with PHP spec. Haven't got a slide about that. Right, so that's interesting so far, right? Everyone happy? Good, good. Uh, so now the interesting stuff. So objects, methods returning values isn't that interesting in OO. Uh, if you were in, in the last talk, which you probably were, because there's only one track, uh, you know, just pushing values into objects and pulling them out again violates uh, item nine, is it? Nine? getters and setters. So having objects that are just dumb repositories of data isn't that interesting. When I set the name, I can get the name again afterwards. It's kind of boring. The interesting stuff about object-oriented programming is that um, they talk to each other, objects. Sometimes when I talk to one object, it doesn't just return a value, it maybe talks to another object. And that guy talks to another guy who talks to another guy. It's called collaboration. So obviously that's very important to describe in as fluent a way as possible. So let's look at a, uh, a next responsibility of our object. We've covered the one responsibility. When it greets you, it says hello. Let's come up with another responsibility that is maybe going to involve another object. When it greets a person called Bob, it should return hello, Bob. Cool. So the relationship between these two objects is that my greeter is going to have to ask the other person, what's your name? What, what are you called? My name's Bob. This is a query. The object we're testing and we care about is going to ask for data from another object. And so the style we use to do that kind of interaction test is stubbing. We're not going to test it with a real user, a real Bob. There's lots of reasons you might not want to test with the real user. Um, it might be hard to get a real user. It might be the user needs a database connection. It might be hard to set the name of a user. It might only have a getter. It might be difficult to manipulate it into the state where it's going to tell you its name is a specific value. A good example is a currency converter. You can't test with a real one because the rates would change all the time. You wouldn't be able to write a predictable test. So we try and make this as descriptive as possible. This is what it looks like in PHP spec. I've got my existing example. 
I add another example. It greets a person by name, and there's going to be a thing called a person. We haven't created the person yet. We don't, it doesn't have to exist yet. When I ask the person for their name, it will return Bob. This is the stubbing. So this object, it's not going to be a person object. It's going to be something that extends person and doesn't do anything, doesn't have any behavior, is easy to instantiate. And I create it just by asking for it in the type hint. PHP spec will ask its mocking library prophecy to create the double and inject it in. So there's, a pers there's this guy. When you call get name on this guy, he'll say his name's Bob. When I ask this thing I'm specking to greet Bob, it'll return hello, Bob. Again, trying to be readable. Um, when I run it, it will probably fail. Does anyone know what's going to fail? What's the first thing that's going to fail? You can shout. Hmm? I can't hear you guys. You all need microphones. OK. Um, so it fails because there's no such thing as a person yet. I haven't bothered building the person. This is another example of PHP spec trying to be helpful. It says you're, you're describing the interaction with something else. Do you want me to create an interface uh, for that interaction? So why an interface? Why isn't it offering to create a class? It's because it's opinionated. We want to give you the opportunity to introduce an interface instead of having lots of concrete classes coupled together. And actually, for me, this makes me stop and think. Do I want an interface called person? It, sounds like, it doesn't sound like something that would be an interface. There's this thing, the interface segregation principle. Um, does my greeter really need to depend on a person? Does it need everything a person can do? If you think about a person, the, the person object, when, when we get around to building it, is probably going to have lots of methods for lots of different things you know, to do with users. But as, as far as my greeter is concerned, all I care about is this get name. All I really care about is something that's named. So if I introduce an interface that isn't the person, I'll be able to reuse my object in the future. I'll be able to greet things that aren't people. You could greet a dog, or a cat, or a you know, ship. So it makes me stop and think. Maybe, I'm, maybe I don't want to type hint person there, because person doesn't sound like uh, an interface. So I go back and change my specification. I'll hit no. I'll go back and change the specification and change it to named. You can call it nameable if you want to or has name interface, if you want. But there's some concept in my system. Things have names, and I'm going to represent that with an interface. I'll run the test again. So now it says, would you like to create an interface called named? Uh, yes, I would. Breaks again, because I try and call uh, get name on this interface. Offers to add a method definition to that interface runs again and then has a proper failure. I said it would say hello, Bob, but it just said hello. So the, the tool is getting rid of a lot of that boilerplate stuff, and it's also helped me think a little bit about my design. It's helped me think about how it's going to interact with another object. And we've got to the point where the, the tests are, uh, are executing correctly, because the tool has generated this interface that describes the interaction that I'm I'm specifying. And this is enough for me to continue working on the greeter object and thinking about all the behaviors the greeter might have to have. Later, I'll have to go and build a person. But for now, I can stay in this context of working on greeter and thinking, what else should this do? So it is very much about your design process. It's not about bolting tests onto legacy applications, for instance. There are better tools for that. Uh, and it's obvious why it's failing. It doesn't say, hello, Bob. So this is the first time in the presentation where I have to write some code that isn't a spec. Uh, and it's a pretty trivial implementation. You add an optional parameter. Because remember, the, 
These things are design documents, they're specifications, but that first example is now sitting there in my suite. And it's kind of become a regression test as well. So someone can read that specification and see the different cases. Also, it's going to preserve that existing behavior. If I don't pass, if I don't pass an argument, it just says hello. So I need some kind of branch. Maybe not the best solution. Could probably get rid of the if somehow. Null object, something like that. A null named person. But that's enough to get me to a green state and a, and a passing test. By the way, I spent about a day making the animation on that progress bar super smooth. So when you use the tool, I hope you appreciate it. It used to flicker and it really bugged me. Now it's beautiful. Um, so I've done my greeter. There's, there's a problem that my test suite's passing, but I've got an object that relies on named things. And I've kind of forgotten about my overall requirement that we have to greet real people. I have to now go and build the person object. So it's very typical that when you're working with very low level tests like this, you'll want some other kind of testing at a higher level. It might be acceptance tests with BHAT, it might be an integration test, you write a PHP unit, it might be you keep loading the web page and hitting refresh. Hands up if that's how you test. You refresh the browser. Yeah. But you, you'll feel that you know, you're making sure all the components are correct, but you'll feel you have to keep checking the whole thing works together. So the next step is to uh, go and build the person. So we'll go through the whole cycle again a bit quicker. I'm trying to give you a feel for what this workflow feels like. When you ask Bob for his name, he's going to say, my name is Bob. Describe a person. Uh, write the first example. It returns the name it was created with. So this is how you specify constructors. Just be constructed with this, with this value. Um, there's support for a thing called uh, static named constructors, if that's the style you use. But for now, this is just describing a normal constructor. Be constructed with Bob. Get name should return Bob. I'm trying to be readable. Right? When I run it, person doesn't exist. Do you want to create person? Person doesn't have a constructor. Do you want to create a constructor? You described be constructed with, but there's no constructor. Um, it's meant to have this method get name. Do you want me to add a method called get name? And then it fails. I expected Bob, but got null. But look how much has been done for me. A lot of that, you know, a lot of the specification stuff, what's the API look like? What are these methods named? That's been written for me. I need to do the behavior, the implementation, which in this case is uh, quite trivial. And I have this, these descriptions have turned into tests. So now I, I know if I've done it right. I can stop typing when the test goes green. Another example, when Bob changes the name to Alice, you should return the new name. This is very important. Um, so I had another example. So be constructed with Bob, change name to Alice, the new name is Alice. Easy. Uh, if you're into your rules of simple design, you'll spot there's some duplication. In both cases, the, the um, object we're interacting with it starts off by being called Bob. So we can extract that to a method called let in PHP spec that's going to apply for every example. So it's meant to read well. Let this be constructed with Bob. Returns the name it's created with. Get name should return Bob. Returns the new name which's been renamed. Change name to Alice. Get name should return Alice. Short, concise. I try not to have any examples that are more than a few lines long. Generally indicates maybe it's doing too much stuff. But that's opinionated of me. When I run it again, do you want me to create change name to? Yes. I change the name, but it's still returning Bob. I have to go in find the method that's been inserted, and then add the implementation that's needed to pass the test. Hopefully that all makes sense. And you can see that just by going through that cycle of TDD very rapidly, 
you break down these large problems into very small problems. So the first thing it has to do is exist. The second thing Bob, the person has to do is remember its name. I go through a whole cycle and I've got working code. The third thing it has to do is, for example, if it's called Bob and you change the name to Alice, that change has to stick. And then I quickly go through a whole cycle. So TDD at this level, or BDD at this level, it's all about limiting the amount of decision making you're having to make. You're just thinking, what's the next thing it has to do? How do I make that next thing happen? This isn't really a TDD talk. There's a third part of the cycle called refactoring, where you tidy up after yourself and you make sure you're not making bad design decisions. So that's one interaction between objects. I'll go back to it. Oh, where was it? It's too far back. <laughs> you have to page through all this again in a second. This is bad talk design, excuse me. Um, yeah, I should have tested it. Yeah, so this interaction here, we've got this thing, and we're saying how the double, it's a test double, it's like a stunt double, we're saying how it's going to behave during the test. We're, we're controlling what value it's going to return. It's called stubbing, and it happens because the object I'm interested in is retrieving data from that collaborator. The important thing with this kind of test is the thing we actually check during the test is a return value. We're not actually checking that that method got called. It's not important. We're saying, in a situation where you have an object that returns Bob, here's some other behavior my object's going to have. And that some other behavior is what we actually care about in the test. To contrast with that, sometimes the point of the test is that you care a particular method is called. You care that an invoice is approved. You care that an object is persisted. You care that something happens. So the thing you're actually going to test is that a method was called. And that, that's a big difference. When you get into TDD, it's not obvious which situation you're in sometimes. But that is a very different situation. So another example for our greeter. As well as saying hello to the user, we need to log the fact that the user got greeted. So this is an example where my greeter object is going to have to tell some other part of the system that something happened. And you can characterize that interaction as a command. My object is going to command a logger to log something. It's going to poke the logger. We're not going to be able to test that by checking that some return value happened. We have to actually check that a method call happened. This is where mocks or spies come in. Um, there's some confusion about the vocabulary uh, of mocks. Um, a while back, mocks was used mostly as the um, generic term for all of these doubles. And there's quite an influential book and a couple of blog posts by Gerard something. Uh, ex unic design patterns book that clarified that mocks were a specific type of test double. Um, so you'll find tools with more of a history, like PHP unit will use get mock, um, whereas some of the tools will use mock just to refer to this kind of test. So in some, this is a style of test where I care that a particular method call happened. And in PHP spec, we have two ways of doing it. I can either use a mock, which is a style more familiar if you've used PHP unit, or I can use a spy, which is a style I personally find more readable, but uh, that is not uh, universally agreed. So here's an example uh, that we already had. So I'm going to add, I'm going to extract the um, stubbing, as we discussed. So it just removes that from here. 
So let is going to be executed for every example. What's important is that as long as you type hint the same instant, the same, sorry, as long as you use the same argument name, um, PHP spec will make sure it's the same instance injected into both methods. So when this example executes, it's going to create a double. It's going to set that double up so when you ask it its name, it says its name is Bob. It's then going to make sure the test is executed, the example is executed with the same instance. So that's just a refactoring. We can now add a description of how we're going to log the fact that the greeting happened. It logs the greeting. Let's start at the bottom here, it's easier. It logs the greeting and we're going to involve the guy who knows his name is Bob and a new thing called a logger. I'm going to greet Bob and then this is the thing we test. This is the thing that causes the suite to fail if it's not true. The log method on this object with this parameter should have been called. How does the greeter know about the logger? At this point, I can, uh, again, say the greeter has to be constructed with a logger instance. And um, PHP spec will inject it through the constructor. This should have been called is the spying style. If, if you prefer mocks, you can just move this upper line and say should be called. So this is like you do the action, then you say what should have happened. You can do it the other way around. You can make a prediction about the future, and then you can do the action. So now when I run it, everything breaks because suddenly I've started talking about a logger being injected into this object, and we never had that before. So it offers to create the logger. Everything fails again because I've described a constructor. So it says, do you want me to make a constructor for you? I'm calling a method log on this logger interface. And now I get a failure. The failure says, I expected the logger's log method with the value hello Bob to have been called, and it never was. So the, t the, the test suite's failing because something we described never happened. And it's kind of trivial to now add that logic. This is the state the class is in after running through that loop. A constructor's been added. Um, so I can just capture the logger that's added in the constructor and I make sure I call that method. As described, after I greet someone, I log that I greeted them. And everything passes. Hooray. So what have we built so far? I went very slowly through that, but we've ended up with a greeter object that has a couple of different behaviors. If you just ask it to greet, it um, says hello and logs that. If you ask it to greet something that implements this new interface we defined called named, it will, it will do so. We also generated a concrete instance of a person who implements that interface. So this interface is kind of a future expansion point. It's in our core domain. It's not really an infrastructure thing. We just think there might be some stuff in the future that we might want to greet as well. We've also generated a logger interface that um, is kind of defining how we're going to plug actual logging mechanisms into our system. So the objects in our system are going to talk to this interface. And um, we're going to have some kind of adapter to a real logging system. Maybe monolog, probably. Probably monolog. Um, we're going to adapt that to a real logging system. But we've got a concept inside our domain of a logger in my namespace. This is a traditional way of displaying a domain model. But um, something else we've created is documentation of our domain model. We've got a description of the behaviors uh, of all of, of the two concrete objects that we've built in our system. And that's just derived from the, the names of the examples, the method names. But 
something I've started to appreciate more and more is this is as much a domain model as the, the UML thing. Reading that can be just as valuable to other developers on your team uh, as, as some crazy binder full of UML. Just reading through the tests and seeing exactly for each case what's supposed to happen. So that's PHP spec. Hopefully I've shown that it focuses on being descriptive. I know we looked at a lot of detail for these examples, but uh, the aim is for it to be easy to read by a PHP developer. Normal people can't read this stuff. You need to use something else. Um, you'll have seen the workflow. Writing the test first means a lot of stuff just happens for you. The tool's building a lot of things. It gets you into a kind of state where you just step by step adding features. It does drive your design. Um, I didn't include any examples of bad code in the slides, but things we won't let you do. Won't let you test private methods. That's crazy. Um, won't let you do a partial mock of an object. You have to just design new stuff. My experience of applying PHP spec on legacy apps is that it does work if you're taking pieces of functionality extracting them into a new class, and you're writing a spec for that class. That class is going to do something new. It doesn't work to go and try and write specifications for existing god objects inside your system that are 5,000 lines long. That's not going to work. Use PHP unit. Um, it's a friendlier project, PHP unit. Um, so it's been about a year and a half since I took over this project. We've gone through five minor versions. We're actually getting ready for our, it's actually only the second major version of this code base because it was a complete rewrite. And um, it's been very interesting looking after an open source project. It's not something I'd done before, looked after a big open source project people actually use. Um, what have I learned? I've learned that semantic versioning is really hard. And if you break backward comp compatibility, people will get really angry on GitHub and tell you you're an idiot. So something we're doing for version three is we're making a lot of the classes final. So you know you can't extend them. <laughs> so if I change it, tough. Um, and actually going through that process, we've really found that people chip in with their use cases and chip in with where an expansion point is going to be useful. We build those things into the project. Um, much like PHP unit, as Sebastian mentioned, we're dropping, we're aggressively dropping old dependencies. So the next version in June is going to support PHP 5. Um, version 4 will be out next June and probably won't support PHP 5. It depends how much the PHP release schedule shifts. Um, and version 3 at the moment isn't adding loads of stuff on top of version 2.5. It's mostly internal restructuring for new stuff we're going to be adding in the future. So some things, um, cleaner extension mechanisms. There's quite a few PHP spec extensions. It's quite extendable, but add extra fancy features for you. Um, we want to make it easier to add custom matches. We want it to more proactively offer to do stuff for you, which sounds a bit scary, maybe. Um, and we essentially want to keep going in a way that um, doesn't add any features that you might abuse to write bad code. And only adds features that we think are going to encourage good code. Uh, it's kind of a core team of about three people being very opinionated about design choices. So if you do start using the tool, please give us lots of feedback about is it getting in your way for, for real use cases. I hope I've given you an overview of it. I hope you're, you're interested. I'm here for the rest of the day and tomorrow. If you want to talk about PHP spec or you know, ask things you're too scared to ask in an auditorium. Uh, my name's Kieran. Um, all of the talks at this conference are on joined in, um, which if you haven't used before, it's easy to register with. You just, if you've got a Twitter account, it's very easy to register with. And we all really appreciate feedback on our talks. Um, it really does help us make them better. Uh, so I'll say thank you.
I think we've got some time for questions, but that's the end of the talk. Thank you. So, what, questions. What questions do you have? It is scary in front of this many people, but don't be shy. Um, so, my main reference point while watching this was PHP Unit, because mm -hmm. I'm familiar with it. Uh, so, I'm going to ask, uh, does it support fixtures and interfacing with database testing for... Yeah, great equipment? question. Uh, that's a really good example of the difference. It specifically is never going to let you test your database. So, why is that? Why is that? Just an asshole. Um, with, we want, it's specifically aimed at testing the core of your business domain, your PHP objects. So if you want to talk to a database somewhere, we want you to have an interface that expresses how you're going to talk to the database, um, like some kind of repository. And that's the boundary of where this tool is aimed at. So if you want to test that a real-life database has a real-life record in it, there are other tools for that. And actually, having an interface in place is a very nice boundary of how you're going to write these tests. You can have lots of tests of your core domain. In something like PHP spec, everything's just in PHP. By defining that interface, you'll find it doesn't have that many methods. So then on the other side, you can write an integration test that starts a database. And often you'll have, you know, set with a database, with a repository, you'll have a save method, find by ID, find by some other field. You'll have like three things. And then if you're looking just in that context, how am I going to test this? I'll save something and check and get I can get it back by ID. I can't think of any other tests, right? So having that boundary point is very interesting to me. So when I'm writing a system, I'll have PHP spec for that core. If I want to write that integration test, I'll use PHP unit and its convenient data fixtures. Uh, another feature we don't have is data providers. So in PHP unit, a data provider lets you run the same test with lots of different inputs. That's not, that's a, that's to me is a testing practice. It's not a design practice. When I'm designing something, I'm going to think of each of those sets of data one at a time as they occur to me. And I'm going to write a spec an example for that set of data, and I'll probably give it a title to say why it's important. Uh, so that's another difference. But I do use PHP unit all the time for like over 10 years. <laughs> and we're doing a talk about it tomorrow. All right, hey, I'm here, down here. Yeah, oh, oh you. <laughs> <laughs> Has Marco asked a question at every talk so far? Yeah. Um, I'm interested in an uh, implementation other detail. Could you go back to the slide of the matchers? You know oh, it's really far going? back. Hang on. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, if you have an interface with return type hints, yeah. how are you working around this? Like, how is the, this method magic? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm interested in. You want the de technical implementation? Yes. So uh, this is, this is uh, like asking to see someone's dirty laundry. God, where's my example? So you mean with a double, specifically? The matcher. How do you override the return type? Oh, because we're not calling it on the real object. We're calling it on this. OK. So you're calling the method actually on the specification. That calls the real thing and gets whatever that actually returns. And then it kind of wraps it in an object that you can then call matches on. So when I call this greet, it gets the real object, calls greet, returns a wrapped version, and the wrapped object it has should return. Yeah, but the stubs that you pass to the test, well, to the specification and, method. And dollar this doesn't, it impl doesn't have the same type as the thing we're testing. OK, fair enough. The, the test doesn't extend the real object, right? The thing I thought you were asking about which is even more exciting, <laughs> is in this case where person returns a string, how, how is it that I'm able to call another method? And that's the magic. Uh, the object doesn't actually implement the type person because of magic. 
It's something else. And this broke in PHP 7. And we fixed it in the worst way possible. <laughs> if you're interested, we include the spec through a stream wrapper that removes the type hint. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, for the instantiation of the class, when we first write the class, we generally need to first write the test. We need to know what it's supposed to be doing, what, what should have been the result of the doing mm -hmm. of the class, of the methods, of the returns, of the returning values. We need to know what they are and just reference the output with the input of the real return, should return, or any other that are custom methods that we write on our own, or yeah. does PHP spec has some default values, as you said, it would be final. Does that mean we don't extend by the class, or just import at the, at the beginning to, I'm not sure to I copy the, the code? I don't, I'm not, don't quite understand. What, what's the question? Um, if we get the person get name, get the, some value of get name, yeah. as, as a getter or setter, doesn't matter. Yeah. We test it as a wrapper function or an, another method which, which, which goes down with the... Oh, so you mean if you're extending another object extend. that someone else controls? Yeah, the control. And oh yeah, so if you like, you extend some base class, do you write tests for all of those class, things? Base class, import the base class, and with the base classes, use their functionality to test our own code. Yeah, so an example, would be, an example would be a repository, uh, if you decide to extend Doctrine's repository, right? Um, generally, that's hard to test, because you, you take a lot of responsibility for the parent class and how it works. I'm much this kind of approach leads, I wouldn't write tests for that. And I'd probably try and use um, composition instead. So instead of in extending parent classes, I'd try and inject an instance of someone else's class and, and write my own class. I, th I hope that was what you're asking, but ask, come to me later. We are out of the time, so okay. you can continue talking with Thank me. Thank you, everyone.